Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming out before uh, the snowpocalypse hits this afternoon. I'm hoping it's another one of those high drama, low impact storms, but we will see. Uh, I want to introduce Jenny Kyle here. She's got a good topic for uh, most of the people in the room and probably something I can learn too. Um, Jenny Kyle has been on the faculty at Hamlin since 1999. Currently, she's a management, marketing, and public administration department chair teaches undergrad courses in economics and management, as well as leadership courses in the MBA program. Jane's research focuses on how women interact with and are impacted by the economy, and she holds a PhD and an MBA degree from the University of Kansas and a BBA degree from the University of Michigan. So I'm glad we got her out here to talk before she leaves the state. I'm not going to try to not name when I'm closing too much because we're a nice, a nice group. So I would say good morning, ladies, and thank you, Jim, and thank you, Luke, and Chino, for being <laughs> brave men in the room when we talk about the pay gap. So everything is food. Feel free to get up and refill your plates while I'm yapping. I know the value of these is really what happens around the table. So this isn't a workshop in the sense that there'll be lots of times to talk around the table, but I do want to kind of buzz through some material, give you a chance to connect with each other at the end. So thanks for having me. It's going to be a fun morning. All right. So I thought what we would do is just a brief overview of the pay differential. I have several um, slides that are different visuals of how we can look at it and think about it. Um, it's very easy topic to get a little bit emotional on pretty quickly because it feels very personal and it is very personal. But we'll, we're going to try to talk kind of at a systems level today to begin and then we're going to dive down into what can one person do to impact your pay. Um, and I, I thought um, it might be helpful to tell you why I've been continuing to talk about this since graduate school. It's an important topic to me and it's also something that's pretty tricky to solve. So. I naively thought in graduate school, if I just you know, put my full resources around this problem, clearly I could fix it, but now here I am, you know, it's not 1999 anymore, and I'm still talking about the same thing, so this problem will outlast my, my career at Hamlin, but maybe not all of our careers as we actively look to do something about it. So I thought about an icebreaker that might work, maybe it won't, but maybe it will. I thought, what a better way to talk about pay than to get people talking about pay? So I thought you could just say, hi, my name is Val, and I'm $45,000. I thought you should have the information around the table. Would that work? Yeah, that's how much you have? No. Okay, so that, now here's what you're actually going to talk about for two minutes around the table. Why would that not be a really comfortable icebreaker? What's the big deal with pay, ladies and gentlemen? Why don't we just say, hi, I'm Jenny, and I make $65,000. Know, why don't we just throw a number out there? So talk about that just for a minute, because I, I need to get you, get you thinking about that question. Mm -hmm. some pictures, because I think it's going to be easier to talk about pay in the abstract to begin, not the personal, hi, my name is Jenny, here's how much money I make. So this is one way to look at the gender pay differential. I haven't been thinking about it since 1955, but I have been thinking about it since somewhere in here, right? And so looking at women's median weekly, which is the red line, or women's median annual, which is the blue line, we can see some upward progress. We see a topping out around 80. The number you probably heard, going in maybe on NPR this morning, mm -hmm. or maybe in the New York Times two weeks ago is 77. Sense, right? So for every dollar that a man earns, on average, all jobs put together, women earn between 75 and 80 percent of that number. So this is visually what the pay gap looks like. Another way to look at the pay gap is to say what happens in the left graph here over a person's um, own life cycle, own working life cycle. So we can say, see a couple things. Um, First of all, obviously the male line is higher, right? There's the gap. But the interesting thing in this graph to me is making a mental note of when wages level off. So if you're a female, you can see, boy, by like age 35 or 40, I'm kind of at my peak earnings uh, if I'm a typical average female worker. But if you're a male, you're not leveling off until, you know, 50, 50 years old. <coughs> So we've got multiple things at play, and we can say, huh, 
what's going on between age 22, let's say when I get out of undergrad, until age, you know, 35? Anything in particular happening in, in a typical woman's life during that time, right? There's a lot of jazz going on in that 15 years. And it's also it's the same exact time, ladies, when you're supposed to be experiencing your big exponential pay growth so that then you can level off when you get to the right old age of 38, let's say. Right? So we've got a couple things working against us here. But another way to look at it, and again, I think I heard Luke say something about when we first graduated, we talked about how much everybody was making, right? So when you're first out of undergrad, <coughs> entering the labor force full time, you're often an individual contributor. You get hired to do a job and nobody reports to you. You just take that job and go. But as you progress through many leadership positions, the gap widens. So another interesting thing to think, to think about. Right away, we're often very similar, but something's going on in the job progression is leading to a bigger gap when we get to the higher paying positions. Um, one more graph to show you. Every time I just click on this, it takes forever. So I'm going to go to this and show it to you. This is my favorite go-to interactive graph on the pay differential. If you, I'm, I'm very happy to share these slides if you want to, you know, take them home with you and think about them more. But this. Slide in particular, if you just remember in your head, why is your paycheck smaller? And you Google that, you get this interactive New York Times graph. So what's fun about this is we have men's median weekly on the X, we have women's median weekly on the Y, and we have a big black line of equal wages. Every dot on this graph is a different occupation. So if every, in every occupation, women and men made the same amount of money, Every single colorful dot would be lined up on the black line. So the fact that every dot is below the black line except for a couple says in every occupation we can study, women are paid less. And so the, the other thing about this graph is we have, we're able to compare lower paying occupations. So this is weekly earnings, you know, we're earning $250, $500 a week as a fruit, food preparation worker. We are making 8% less than men. But if we come out here to the higher paying jobs, computer and information systems managers, here's 14%. Here's our lawyers, 22% less. CEOs, even pharmacists, right? So high paying jobs. The farther away I am from the black line, physicians and surgeons, the more the gap. And somebody had a good story. Yeah, it was Brian. Right? Yeah. So, you want to tell you just real quick? Sure, sure. I was with um, family physicians, and we recently, our organization did research around a lot of different things, and one of them was the pay differential between male and female family physicians. And I, I want to say a female physician makes about 180000 and a male is 120. Pretty significant. Amazing. Yeah. Right? So, again, we could, we could instantly kind of go to crabbiness and rage about this, or we could say, let's just think about what might be going on here. So I've always been more of the let's just think about what might be going on here kind of approach to this. So um, let me tell you what I think is going on here. First of all, there's the way to study the pay gap is they say, what can I um, notice about people? What can I measure about people that would impact how they're paid? Because clearly we would say that food preparation workers and physicians would make different amounts of money. So the big three variables that matter that impact pay are what's your education level, how many years have been working and continuously working is, is ideal if your goal is to maximize your pay, and what's your occupation. So if I can control for those three things, I can shrink the pay gap for sure. So that 77 cents number is always just all jobs at all levels for all people. It doesn't control for anything. The interactive graph controls for occupation. So controlling for all the people that are physicians and surgeons, is there still a gap? So the big question that I've answered, that I've, that I've thought about and tried to answer since graduate school is what variables impact pay that aren't measurable? Because this is where economists fall down, right? Rightly so. Social scientists fall down. If we can't measure it, we don't know what to do about it. We think it matters, but we don't know what to do about it. The big three I've been talking about 
that I spent my first sabbatical really thinking about and, uh, and edited this book are risk, salary expectations, and negotiation. So we have a uh, workshop coming up on the 19th over the lunch hour. Go Molly, right? It's going to be me again, in case you haven't heard enough of me talking on this topic. I know Jody's heard it since grad school, so it's part of my thing I've been talking about, right? But you can come back and we can talk a little bit more about risk. But let me just briefly today tell you that in a whole bunch of different areas, there's actual measurable evidence that men are more willing to take risks than women. How you invest your retirement portfolio, so we look to finance literature, much more risky investment strategies on average pursued by men and women. Biology data, right? There's an enzyme in our blood that certain biologists have measured that they tag as the sensation-seeking enzyme. And guess what? Men have lots more of that on average than women. So you can think of the silly examples, bungee jumping, skydiving, right? Men are sort of hardwired, we would say, to take more risks. Now, does that translate to the kind of occupations they pick? It, it could, right? It absolutely could. And if the occupation you pick puts a whole bunch of your total compensation at risk in the form of uh, a bonus or in the form of um, commission pay, you would sometimes make a whole lot more money than you would if you had an average fixed salary. So when you think about investment <coughs> advisors or people that make investment decisions, the typical stockbroker, you don't often picture a female. I mean, that we've been trying to break into that occupation. There have been um, Hamlin alums that I've referred, you know, the recent grads to investment type of investment jobs. And the one particular woman I'm thinking of lasted only a couple of years, but I was proud of her because there were 15 women before her that I couldn't even get interested in that occupation. So occupational choice matters and the, the, inter the relationship between your willingness to assume some risk <coughs> that can impact your pay. But expectations and negotiation skills we can spend just a little bit more time thinking about. If you were a group of undergrads, I would ask you this question, and Luke and Val might remember this question from undergrad. I'd say write down three numbers. What are you going to make when you graduate? What do you think you'll make in five years? And what do you think you'll make in ten years? in my class would do this, and then I'd take their data, and they would just say, I'm a male, and I'm 21 years old, and here's what I, here, here are my three numbers. And then I would come back the next day in class, and I would show them something like this. Every single year, there's a gap in the expectations around the pay. So part of the lesson for undergrads is, of course, the obvious ladies, you need to expect more, right? You need to do a little research and expect more. My funny personal expectation story is right after undergrad I went to work on Wall Street and I made $25,000. And everybody that was hired into my job made $25,000, seven women and seven men. So for my start of my career, I had no idea there was a pay gap because we just knew we all made the same. But what I knew was, dang, $25,000 is not enough to live comfortably in New York City, right? So I found myself in Brooklyn, commuting into Manhattan, but my expectation was, everything will be okay one day when I finally make $40,000. Like for whatever reason, I don't know why I thought 40 was the magical number, but I promise you, the seven men that knew they were working on Wall Street in the mid-80s, they were not thinking $40,000, right? There's some men that are thinking, I'm gonna make it $100,000, and this, you know, this blue line goes up because there's always one or two in an econ class that say, a million dollars. <laughs> Ten years and I'll make a million dollars. So the other part of the lesson is, gentlemen, I hope so, right? I hope so, but let's be a little more realistic about our expectations because this does drive your willingness at work to take assignments, to talk to your supervisor in a certain way, and to expect that in a limited pool of money, you might still get to carve out more of that if you're a high performer. So examining your own expectations around pay is a good exercise. What I really want to talk to you about though is negotiation. And this is um, this is the part where it'd be great if it could be a little bit more workshoppy. We'll have a little bit of a chance to brainstorm around this. But if you want to, we need to get Bosley lined up to do one of these morning talks because she's our behavioral 
economist on campus, and she is um, great at this stuff. So economists know that it's very hard for people to tell you how they're going to react to a particular situation. And in certain situations, it's better for people to be put through an experiment and we'll, I'm going to watch what you do. Right? So behavioral economics says, here's what we know when we run people through experiments about pay. Women do not ask for more pay. And they're just not comfortable asking. So Linda Babcock has made an entire career <coughs> out of training people to ask for more, and we'll talk about that. Lisa Barron, though, is not quite as well known. She has examined what people are thinking while they're negotiating for a pay increase. And this is what I find so fascinating. Because when you look at men and women, you bring them into a room and you say, the purpose of this experiment is for you to lobby for yourself and negotiate for more pay. So there's no bones about why you're here, right? Also, know that during this experiment, people that are going to be run through the experiment after you were given a higher salary to begin with. So you're coming into the room to negotiate, first of all, knowing you do have to negotiate and knowing that other people are starting at a higher salary. So you're kind of frustrated, right? So then you sit down and you do your, your pretend negotiation. And based on the number that you agree, you leave the room with a certain portion of that pay or you know, more candy bars if you, you get more. So you, there's a little bit of an incentive for you to actually do this. But what Lisa Barron found is the thing that men and women are thinking while they're, negotiation, while they're negotiating is completely different. Women are saying things like, wow, um, I felt good about where I ended because I'm right out of school and I, I don't have a lot of experience in this area, and I do kind of the same job as everybody else, so it seemed like a fair number, like we should all be paid about the same. Women are talking to themselves and talking themselves into justifying their pay among a group so that nobody stands out. Men, in the exact same experiment, say, well, I was thinking that I'm not, I'm not a typical graduate, I'm better than everybody else, so I should get paid a whole lot more. Like, they're actually thinking, why on earth would I settle for this amount of money when I know for sure I'm better than him and her and her, so I'm going to ask for more. Like, what's the lead, what's the, the most that could happen? They might say no. But if you don't ask, it's very seldom that they're going to come to you and say, and here's more money. By the way, we love to hire you and we're going to be way more than you thought. That would be great if that's how it works, but it's not how it works. So what we know from behavioral economics is that women are not hardwired to like to negotiate, which is why it's such an important thing to think about. And it's something to, to not beat yourself up about, ladies, right? And it's not saying that all men are natural <coughs> negotiators, right? It's a sort of an awkward thing, and you have to do your homework, which we'll talk about. But knowing that there's there's a couple layers of things going on. You're thinking one thing, you're expecting, you know, whatever it is that you're expecting, and then you're sort of predisposed to not be as risky as other people in the same situation. I think those three things together do explain some portion of that gap that we can't measure by other things. So that's why since 1955, when we started measuring this, that's one reason the gap is still around. There's lots at play here. I have a long quote for you to take a peek at for a minute, but I want you to try to figure out who said this, and I'm giving you a clue. So let's read this for a minute. about her recent negotiation. This is Jennifer Lawrence, right? Why did she and Amy Adams get 7% of the box office revenue when the two men get 9%? Because Bradley Cooper and Christian Bale were not walking into that negotiation saying, I hope they like me. I need them to like me. They needed to get two more percent of the earnings of that movie. 
So this, this I think is fascinating, because that behaviors and belief research was like 15 years ago, and this was two, month, you know, two months ago. So it's, it, it perpetuates, and you think, why does it perpetuate? Why do we have things that we tell ourselves in our head, ladies, that we sort of pass on generation after generation? Where is that coming from, and which generation is going to be the one that, that breaks that pattern of behavior? So um, here's what we're going to do. This is the little interactive part. If we're going to zoom in on, hey, I want to, I want to teach you a little exercise that will help you ask for a raise, but the way that you start building up your confidence to negotiate for money is to not actually start with money. Right, so learning how to negotiate and learning how to ask for what you want is something that you can practice, and it's something that most of us don't practice, but we should, in this instance, my personal opinion is start with something that's sort of benign and easy and train yourself, because it is an actual method, and then we'll go for the big pay conversation maybe in a month or two, right? My funny little ask on this is um, when you take clothes to the dry cleaner, what do they tell you? They say, oh, is Thursday afternoon okay? And you say, sure, and you leave. And then one day I'm like, you really need to ask for these shirts on Wednesday. You can do this, girl. So I'm marching the dry cleaner. I'm like, I'm really going to need these shirts on Wednesday. What do you think she said? Okay, of course. And I'm like, ha, ah, just negotiating. That's so great, right? <laughs> some kind of little silly thing. And then you don't go until Thursday. Right. <laughs> I didn't need them. I just needed to ask, right? Train myself to ask. So I want you to think about at your table, Maybe there's just one or two of you that feel like sharing, or maybe you can all share for about five minutes or so. What is negotiable? Like in what area of your life, here's a way to zoom in on this, is there something that you'd like to change? It could be a work thing, it could be, with undergrads, it's almost always, I have a roommate who's really messy. It's usually the, the messy roommate problem, right? Or it could be, I'm always dropping off and picking up the kids, and I need my partner to drop off once or twice or half the time. Right, or I'm always the one going to the grocery store and somebody else is not. So brainstorm. What's negotiable? What do you need to fix? Let's figure that out. Can you think? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, can we have a few ideas brainstorming? At least somebody at the table has a problem that needs fixing, right? So the, the, the trick is to figure out a technique that we can use that helps you have a conversation with whoever you need to have a conversation with, where it doesn't have to be set up from the start like I'm I'm gonna win and that's really not the best approach to negotiation. So <clears throat> a very a handy little book that's been around forever by the Harvard negotiation team is called Getting to Yes. So if you don't have this on your shelf, I would go to Amazon and buy it for a dollar and keep it on your shelf. Because this is a classic. And you will go back to it again and again. You will use it at home. You will use it at work. You will use it in the community. But there's three important points in this book that we could just talk about for a minute today. First of all, in any negotiation, you have to separate the people that are involved from the problem you're trying to solve. So it does feel personal, right? I saw, I heard it's personal, I feel emotional, I, I know that if I'm gonna get something somebody else isn't, you've gotta let, you've gotta let that part go and you've gotta zip, zone in on the problem and say, I'm not gonna um, talk about the people, that there's just an issue. When you do that, you say, okay, I'm gonna, now this, everything that I'm interested in having happened around this problem, right? Not what am I gonna get from either person, but what am I interested in having happen? I'm not going to dig myself in and, and hold my ground in a position. I'm going to say, what's the, what's the place I want to move to? And when you do that, you start to invent options where both parties feel like they have gotten to a better place. So inventing options for mutual gain. So in the messy roommate example, which may or may not be one you're struggling with at your table, you have you and the other party, right? And then you have interests and options. So this is all pre-work, and my, my husband has negotiated his entire career. The interest and options work, she, he takes in to the most complex business negotiations. He does this work ahead of time every single time because it clarifies his thoughts. And when you put yourself in your shoes, it's easy, right? You live in your own head. You're like, what am I interested in? Well, I'm, you, you might say, I'm interested in that person picking up their stuff. you got to leave the people out of it. So you can say, I'm actually interested in having a peaceful home. I'm interested in being able to have my friends over in an environment that's not a complete pig sky. That's what you're interested in. So it's not about the person, it's about the home. And then your own options, how, how might we solve this? Well, one option is I could 
constantly pick up everything because I have a higher standard for cleanliness. One option is I was telling my son, you need to get your roommates cleaning, or you need to charge them 20 more dollars each month for rent and hire Carolyn to come clean for you because this is ridiculous, right? You're, the way you boys are living is not okay. Let's figure out how we're going to clean up our apartment. <laughs> so there's many options. Hire it done. You know, be, be that person at night that scurries around and puts things away and hides them. And then make people figure out, well, where did my stuff go? Well, I don't know. Where did you leave it, right? So there's lots of options. But here's the key. You've now got to sit in your own head and think like the other person. So if you're, if you're thinking like, I'm not a messy roommate, what am I interested in? I'm actually interested in not getting nagged every single day of my life that I don't pick up enough, right? I'm interested in, maybe I'm also interested in peace in my home, right? I don't want to feel like, roommates don't want to feel like they're living with their mother. They want to feel like they're living in a roommate situation. The minute you take five minutes is all it takes to put yourself in the other person's shoes, you're going to be able to list interests and options from their point of view, and you can start to see that things will align. So that's where the inventing options for mutual gain. When you go into your negotiation, you've done your research, you've thought through the interest and options, and you don't reveal any of that. Right? This is just pre-work. And then you say, I have objectives for my conversation. I want to walk, you know, start to dialogue with you around my pay, around what's going on, but you have all this as backup. It will help you tremendously. So what um, what we really need to do, if we want to zero in on pay for a minute, is we've got to do our homework. Right? We've got to figure out some hard numbers <coughs> for the industry that we're in, for the position that we're in. I know Jeff, we talked about this before. You you're you're in the industry that is, there's clear pay. Like you know what people make, you know what's available, and that that's helpful, right? So why did we start with tell everybody what you make? Because as soon as we don't have information about pay, the employer has all the power. So if it's a secret, which it is in our culture, you know, it's very personal, and somehow we've had pay become this thing that says something about me, that means something relative to other people. It's not just a number that, you know, for a job that I'm doing, it's something about me that perpetuates the secrecy. So we have got to seek out current pay data. You've got to look at industry reports. You've just got to do your homework. There's a couple websites that you can dial in on and get good data. You know, I absolutely did this 100 years ago when I first came here in 1999. I was offered a tenure track job. I was visiting for the first year. And the dean at the time said, you know, when I went through the search process, got hired on the tenure track, it's like, I'm going to pay you $35,000. And I had done my homework and had on one sheet of paper every bit of pay, like similar in the ACTC, other schools, by rank, for my discipline. And I just slid the paper across the table and I'm like, you know, it seems to me, Dean, that based on the homework I've done, $40,000 is a better offer. And he just looked at the paper so we weren't like staring at each other, you know, it was about the problem on the piece of paper. He's like, oh, all right, $40,000. So I asked, you know, I should have probably asked for more because he said yes right away. But I asked, right? But I couldn't have made that ask with any amount of authority if I didn't do my homework. You know, undergrads, this is important too, and especially people that are working, you, you already know the lowest salary you'll accept that you're if you're working, right? You have a salary, you have a baseline. It's really hard when you're a brand new entrant to the labor force and you don't know what's available to you. But thinking through what what is the best alternative I have if what I'm asking for fails, this idea of BATNA, the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. This is all, again, pre-work in your head. What will I go back to? You know, and if you're going back to something that's that's fine and acceptable and even good, that's excellent. That's exactly when you should ask. Because if the answer is no, you're just right where you were and you were you were happy with it. But if you're best alternative to getting somebody to agree to what you're asking them is is a terrible fallback position for you, we've got to do even more homework, right? We've got to modify our ask because you know what you're going back to. But knowing what you're worth and thinking about the other side really does kind of complete the groundwork that's necessary to go into a pay negotiation. You know, it really is not the employer's job to figure all this out for you. My sister years ago was griping about her job and her kids were little and she was recently divorced. And so 
so she's having to put her kids in daycare. And the best strategy she could come up with for asking for more money was you when know, she was practicing on me, or not really practicing, but venting. And she's like, I don't understand why my employer doesn't know how expensive it is to put my kids in daycare. And I thought, well, I get that, right? That's super emotional. I, I agree. It is super expensive to put kids in daycare. And I'm like, Trisha, that is not your problem. That is your problem. Like that, that, that should not, that is not an argument to make for why you should make more money, that you have this huge expense in your life. So, you know, thinking about from the other side's point of view, how they react to your arguments is actually uh, quite key. So you can, um, you know, if you want to just talk about pay a little bit longer, you got to be brave enough to ask, ladies and gentlemen, but then you've got to close your mouth, right? You've got to ask. Have your evidence, and you've got to wait. And you've got to say, this isn't, you know, it needs to be kind of light and friendly. It doesn't have to be a big argument, but it needs to be the problem I'm trying to solve is I need to feel like I'm valued in this organization, and I need to feel like you're noticing that the work I do is excellent. The problem isn't that you need 5000 more dollars, right? It has to be some kind of words along the line of, here's how I'm perceiving you, you know, my role here. Here's what I'm thinking, you're thinking about my future here, and here's what I'd like to ask for. So it's a way bigger conversation than pay. You know, have a range, not a number. You know, you've got your evidence. Give the employer a chance to respond. Sometimes the best thing they can do is say, I hear you, I, I agree with you, now let me go run this up the chain of command. You know, let me go take this to people and see if I can come to an agreement. Your best chance, um, you know, is when you go in fully prepared and you've practiced enough, at least in your head or to the mirror or to your cat, that you hear the words coming out of your mouth because then it's not so emotional. Right? You get to hear yourself saying and presenting your arguments and have it not be the first time you, you say them when you um, go into your employer. So, of course, two weeks ago was a great article in the New York Times. I'm always a little nervous when these articles come out because I've been talking about this for a long time. But I'm like, phew, I've been saying the same thing the New York Times was saying two weeks ago. Lori heard something just this morning yep. on the pay gap. Am I doing okay? Yeah. Okay, good. I don't want to contradict NPR in any way. But um, you know what? If we would just publish everyone's pay, we would have a whole different ballgame, right? So we were bring, over here, we were chatting about wouldn't it be great to figure out a way to bring it out a king of a happy hour once? Who said that? Yeah. Happy hour is always great for talking about money. Happy, <laughs> suddenly information flows. But if you're in a meeting, like, and you really wanted to get at, you know, maybe there's 10 of you around the table, 15, however, you could write, you could all agree that it would be important to write down your salary, put it in the middle of the table, mix it up, and at least you have data, right? So this is a little bit of a um, challenge to you as the leader of a group. If you have people that report to you, you know, what would be the harm? Could you think of a way to do a pay analysis internally? Just who reports to me? Maybe you're in a position where there's 100 people that report to you, right? You have good data then. You could on your own say, I'm gonna do a little gender pay differential analysis and see what's going on. Because maybe there is a problem and maybe there isn't. Maybe there's a discrepancy, maybe there's not. The problem that economists have is we cannot get at internal pay data. All of these studies are dependent on people filling out their tax information, and when that happens, it's um, you know, income for the whole household. Very hard to get really accurate pay data, except at that very highest level of aggregation. So inside your firm, inside your circle of influence, you know, what power do you have to make information about pay more public? It doesn't have to be attached to names, and I'm sure it shouldn't be for a long time in this country. It was in 1986 on Wall Street, on the month, on the door every month. This broker made this much. This broker made this much. It was there, and that's a hyper competitive environment with complete transparency around pay. Everybody knew who the big producer was, and everybody knew who didn't make any money last month. So lots of turnover, right? We don't want to agitate our workforce, but we want to have information that people can react to. Um, you know, this is, again, ideas we can do to close the pay gap, teach women to negotiate, or ban it all together, the article said. Like, if, if we're just really, let's go to the no-haggling job offers, like we do for cars, right? Either the whole game needs to change, 
or a lot of us need to get more comfortable negotiating. I don't think we're going to ban it all together because I think it's too much of how we how we work. Um, you know, making making work easier for working mothers. Anything we can do to make the workplace more flexible because that very first graph that we talked about earnings over your lifetime. What happens, gals? You know this is there's lots of our um, men, lots of women, and some men now that are opting in and opting out of the workforce. So I'm in for a while. I'm out for three or four years. I'm back in. I'm out. And it's not just that during that those childbirth years, but it's the okay, I need to take care of my aging parents. Like there is life that happens that impacts your ability to put a lot of um, uninterrupted time into your job. So that changes, I think, we're going to be kind of perpetuating what we have seen. Um, and then, you know, always a call at the end to just legislate a little bit more. Let's get, let's get some laws around, maybe make it mandatory that companies do internal pay equity analyses and have a plan to fix anything that's, that's, that's looking for people pay for your work. Right. I really don't get right. how people are supposed to do that. It's, it's mind-boggling, isn't it? And yeah. I think I think what happens is we, we can say that and we can follow that, but if there's always a range instead of one number, then there's going to be that room to have somebody be at the higher end. And the, the pay ranges that I've seen are always pay ranges. You know, for this job and this skill level for this many years, it's somewhere in this this range. And if people, um, you know, part of the Part of their uh, behavioral research looks at, uh, looks at competition, men's and women's approaches to competition in general. And what we've seen in research on that is that, again, women often can compete actually just as well as men, perform just as well as men, but given the choice, they want to play. They don't want to play the game. So when the whole game of business is oriented around asking for more and negotiating, seeing what I can get, and women are just not willing to play. Did you skip the question on salary history? So, um, yeah, so the article said, um, we have this habit when we hire people of, of asking people, well, what are you expecting? What, what, did, what did you make in your previous job? This article says, we should not be, who cares? Let that go. Mm -hmm. If you're hiring someone to do the current position, pay the current <coughs> position what the current position is worth. But when we, when we start to build on somebody's Salary history would be like, oh my gosh, they were making fifty thousand dollars, and I was going to pay eighty, but they'd be happy at sixty-five. Right. So again, it gives right. that employer power because there's information, and then how to how to um, the idea was forget it, don't ask for salary history. And undergrads will say, when should I? People people always say, what are you expecting? When should I signal? Right? I, and my answer to when should you signal is is kick that can down the road for as long as you can. When you're in a new interview situation, your job is to make yourself sort of the, the prime candidate. You say, I'm not interested in, uh, I'd rather not talk about salary right yet. What we're trying to do now is figure out if I'm a good fit. So once we determine that the skills that I have match the job that you need done, and we see that I'm a good fit, then I'd, then I'd like to you know, come to the salary piece. But lots of jobs will just kind of ask for that, and then Freedom. Oh, she's overpaid. She'll never take this. You know. Again, it's the secrecy. Who has information? Because that's where the power comes. Mm -hmm. So when you are the hiring manager, if you can do any of these things, it's perfect. I'm curious, Jenny. So think about that New York Times chart, which is kind of an aggregate on yep. occupations. What do you see when it is broken out by sector, whereas government jobs are published? Right. Nonprofits right. tend to kind of follow that. There's a yeah. range. Yep. So between the three sectors, yeah, is the gap that's a really, different? It's a super good question. My, my, I haven't looked at that specifically. Okay. We should, because we're a three-sector yeah. school. Yeah. Somebody <laughs> should. But what I do know is you're exactly right. Because even in the state of Minnesota, we've had um, you know, like the Pay Equity Coalition. Um, we've had people lobbying and working. And you're right. The more public the information is around pay, the smaller the gap, gap for sure. That'd probably be a really good thing for you and I to write up. Because I bet you you're right. Journal I mean, I guarantee you for profit is the yeah. biggest gap, but I, I would imagine nonprofits in the middle are pretty close to Well, uh, nonprofits, um, if you look at the 990 that the IRS requires mm -hmm. nonprofits to publish, at a certain level, yeah. salaries have to be included. Mm -hmm. So there's a 
quite as much transparency as public, but at the executive level. Yeah, or yeah for CEOs and for um, the highest development positions in the nonprofit sector, there's there a gap. Yeah. There's definitely a yeah. gap. Yeah. And they, my, they put the, I mean, you know who the top five yeah. guys paid are, and they have names, mm -hmm. don't right. they? Like, yeah. yeah. Linda Hansen made X, and Doug Anderson made Y. So, yeah, we, we mm -hmm. wow. Okay, so that's what I have, guys. I want you to feel free to talk at the table, talk to each other. I know, that, again, the value is networking, so um, I hope you maybe learned one or two little things, and I appreciate your time. So thanks for coming.